Welcome everybody and thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're very excited to be here with you. My name is Barbara Rappaport. I'm a retired educator from Framingham, Massachusetts and a mother of three. I've taught for over 32 years as a special educator, grade six math teacher, elementary math coach, math specialist and math department head. You can tell I got this math thing going. And currently I'm the academic director with Satellite Prep. On tonight's panel, we have two experts in their fields. Nick Rodriguez. Nick, during his 19 years in private and independent schools, Mr. Rodriguez has served in nearly all roles throughout an institution, including head of school at Brandon Academy and Corbett Prep, assistant head of school at Carrollwood Day School, admissions and advancement director at Bishop McLaughlin High School, as well as teacher, coach, and volunteer. Nicholas is a progressive educator and administrator who believes in a school community focused on students first that prioritizes meaningful relationships and consensus building toward a shared vision. Then we have Drew Valens. Drew Valens has been helping students prepare for standardized tests for the past 20 years. Drew graduated magna cum laude from University of Pennsylvania with focuses in French, theater, and pre-medicine, and then received um, a master's in counseling psychology from Pacifica Graduate Institute in California. Since 2004, Drew has been living in New York City where he spends his time pursuing his three passions, acting, playwriting, and coaching. Drew, you're on. Cool. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you for being here. And I'm just going to say a couple quick things, and we're going to hand it over to Nick as our keynote speaker today. Um, I just want to mention our co-sponsor here, TPAPT. Um, they're a consortium of over 12,000 uh, local independent tutors. So I'm very proud and happy to be a part of that community as well. Um, today's webinar, as you can see from our title, is called Applying to Private High School or you think this is hard, just wait three years when you attend our webinar called Applying to College. Um, so just kidding, sort of. Um, <laughs> yes, there's probably a lot of stress if you have an eighth grader. And if you have an eighth grader, that's probably why you're here. Um, we are gonna spend an hour together, a little bit less. Our goal is to offer you guys a solid orientation to this process. You know, muted, so, um, you know how to proceed. Oh, let me mute somebody there. So that you know how to proceed um, wisely with as little stress as possible. And after we talk for a little bit of time, we will do a Q and A. So if you have questions along the way, please just throw them in the chat. Barbara will field them. We'll answer them as they come or we'll wait till the end. Um, and this will be recorded. So if anybody, and you'll be sent the, the video recording after this. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna hand this over to Nick and we'll we'll bounce back and forth and we'll we'll start talking. So Nick, hello. Uh, thank you so much, Drew and Barbara. That was that was very kind of you. So thank you so much for, for a little welcome there. Uh, to everybody that's joining us tonight, this is actually something that is very near and dear to my heart and probably one of my favorite parts of my job at a pre-K through eighth grade prep school. Uh, the focus on trying to help children find the right spot for them is important to all of us. And as administrators, you know, that's a big part of what this is. And so we're very fortunate at Corbett Prep that we met with all of our eighth grade parents about a week and a half ago and went through this process. And this was one of the slides that we popped up right off the bat. And what we're gonna talk about tonight, just kind of as an overview is looking at the different high schools uh, within the area. What is a private high school? Focusing on some different techniques to be able to figure out, does it work for your family? Does it work for your students? Uh, and then kind of that next progression of what does a timeline look like and what are some key features within that area? Uh, really kind of neat. Yes, my history has the admissions director piece of it, where I was at a high school recruiting eighth graders. And then I had the ability to be at a pre-K through 12th as well, uh, that worked with our eighth graders in our current formats and going through. And now I have the opportunity to help kids get there as well from our eighth grade to other schools. But on top of that, I'm also a uh, father of a freshman son in a local private high school. So I had the opportunity to see it from the parent hat and, uh, and that also uh, woke me up a little bit on some different areas that have changed a lot over the last few years. And many things have changed actually since the pandemic, including some private school enrollment and areas like that. 
So one of the one of the first things, and I, I'm going to read this, and I'm I'm traditionally without reading slides. It's a pet peeve of mine, but I'm going to go ahead and read this specifically because I think it's a need. Uh, feeling safe makes learning possible. The research is clear that students, from our youngest learners to college age students who are in a supportive, comfortable academic environment, are able to learn with success now and into the future. In the right environment, well supported students will engage, engage, stretch, and take intellectual risk. I start with this because one of the challenges that we have as parents and also as educators is we like to rank schools based on different things that are in our mind. And when you're looking at private schools, in most situations, you're looking at very, very uh, strong academic institutions, institutions that have a clear mission and vision. You're looking at student or institutions that have nice facilities and really offer many great things for kids entering freshman year but all of those institutions are slightly different. And much of the time their feel is also different. So when you're looking, and one of the best things I can tell you right off the bat is try to find that place, and we're gonna choose two or three options, but you're gonna to try to find that place that when your students walk through the door, they instantly feel that comfort level. Uh, when you start looking at this, and I'm, I'm an old school guy, so I have a notepad to kind of work through some of these different areas. What does the different fits look like? They could look at it from an academic point of view. You can look at it from a social emotional point of view. You're gonna have the ability to look at it from athletics, the arts, um, robotics programs, STEM programs. What are these different areas that are going to be unique to the institutions you're looking at? But also on top of that, what are those areas that are the most important things for your kids? What is that thing now as an eighth grader that you're looking for that you've now seen that passion start developing what schools really offer those at the highest level? And then on top of that, what schools offer those with an opportunity for freshmen, sophomores, and juniors to be part of it? There's several different areas when you look at private schools. You're looking at schools that range from 350 in their high schools to 800 or 1,000 in their high schools. That's just in our local area, in the Tampa area. Uh, you're looking at schools that have 75 kids per class to you know, the 125, 150 kids per class. Well, looking at those numbers also creates different opportunities for those kids with different electives and activities, but it also changes the ability for a freshman to come in and be part of those different areas. So just as a really overview, this is one of the most important things I can tell you as a parent and also as somebody that we would work with looking at the schools is go and start doing your research on the different schools that you're looking at. Go to their website, dive into their website, Begin looking at what activities they offer. Look at, look at their statements online. Uh, I always recommend, as crazy as it sounds, join their Facebook page, join their Twitter, join their social media, because you're going to see a lot of what that school is truly promoting. If you jump on a social media page and, and all you're seeing is, is adults and giving and you really want a child-centered environment, maybe that's a different post that they like. That's a piece that they believe in. If you're going to their football game, and um, or I'll use an example, if your child loves football and the school you're looking at is without football, uh, probably should be looking at a different school. Uh, and there's schools that focus on those. It's uh, That's a big part of this, but that comfort level is gonna be something that you look at. Uh, Drew, would you mind kind of skipping to the next page here for us? Sure. Yep. Uh, one of the things about this, and I, I love posting this, this was something that we did the other night during our high school night, uh, from eighth to ninth grade was we posted, we went out and I asked uh, privately about six of our different private schools to share their college placement. Uh, because a lot of this, when you're investing in that high school, yes, you're looking at a safety for your kids, you're looking at academics, but you're also hoping, just like Drew talked about, you're looking at what does college placement look like in a few years. So I got a bunch of them and I put them together and we had an IB school locally. We had two or three of the independent schools locally. I asked one of our Catholic private schools locally and one of our diocesan Catholic schools. And then uh, we put all those together and we put them all on our slideshow. And this was one of the ones we put up on our slideshow. The neat part was, is my parents couldn't tell which schools were which. And when I got to this slide, it was kind of cool because this is actually eighth graders from our school that went to every one of those schools in our area. Because if you do some of the things that we're gonna talk about tonight with test prep, and if you look at your electives and you look at how do you get into these independent schools and your child builds that resume, they're gonna have an opportunity to go to great schools, no matter which school they choose, which is the best school for them. 
And, and I think that's an important message that I would hope you would catch from us tonight with this, is that some of this now, it transitioning from eighth to ninth grade as a parent and as a student, it transitions now where a lot of this begins to fall on the student to make the grades, falls on the student to go out to the electives and the clubs and the activities, falls on the student to reach out to teachers when they need help, falls on the student to put in that time for some test prep. So, you know, looking at this, your children, as they go through with their test scores and with their grades and with their electives and all those programs, they're going to build that academic resume at these independent or private schools or Catholic schools or religious schools at these private schools throughout these next few years. So just I wanted to give an overview of some of those messages before we kind of go into what the timeline looks like and hit on some of these different topics specifically for this group. So uh, Drew, we can kind of skip to the next one. Great. All right. So when you're kind of looking at this, hold on one second, I believe we're locking up here at my school. Um, I'm all good, Pedro. Thank you so much. I'm good. Yeah. Yes. Sorry for the little interruption. I'm still at work. <laughs> and um, and uh, so this is one of our timelines that we shared with our families. September, October, for the families that do have eighth graders on, on this page here today with us, uh, September, October, this is your time to research. This is your time to start in attending events. It's time for you to get on their websites and find out when are open houses. What does their admissions office look like? And what does their admissions timeline look like? Who should we be contacting? And then from there, you know, those next steps are the really the big ones that kind of go into why, why Drew is such an important part of this or Mr. Valens. Um, and I'll share a little story about Mr. Valens too in a minute that I didn't tell him I was going to share tonight, but the, um, <laughs> Uh, always, always fun to throw a change up out there. Absolutely. <laughs> so looking at this, September, October, visit prospective schools, find their contact information, start identifying which schools you have an interest in based on your children's uh, gifts and talents as an eighth grader. Uh, you're going to ask for a shadow day, uh, a chance to come in and tour with your student. Now, one of the things that's changed since the pandemic, and I reached out to a local prep school um, down the road today that, that does a wonderful job with high school. I reached out to them today and I asked about their shadow days and they said, Nick, we are actually no longer doing shadow days. Uh, several schools now, and what a shadow day is, is the opportunity for your child to go in and sit with those students for a portion of the day at those areas. Um, since COVID, many schools have changed that. So now there's different opportunities for accepted student days, them joining on tours, maybe joining for a short part of the morning, but it's still worth an ask to see if they have shadow times or they have those different areas. Uh, attend events. You are entering a stage as a parent now that looks much different than middle school. Uh, you're entering a stage now with the private high schools where your child is going to be dropped off after four o'clock in the afternoon to go to events. You're going to have the opportunity to drop them off and go to a play or performance or a dance or a football game. And so that is a large part of the high school experience that happens after 3.30. When you're looking at private high schools, many of those formats look different and their opportunities for kids look different. Go to one of those night events, go check out a play, um, visit the campus during different hours because most of the independent schools or most of the private schools that are around, they are excellent schools. You're gonna get a wonderful education. It's a lot of the auxiliary programs. Are they a progressive school or are they a more traditional school? Uh, when you take a tour of the school, are the desk in straight lines with teacher A at the front of the room or are they in a collaborative approach? Are they in groups? Ask the additional questions that I, I love to share with parents to ask these questions. It's, it's pride points for us. I understand the kids are in groups learning. What structures do the teachers use to engage the students? What training do you put your teachers through to be able to do those type of things? Uh, what does it look like to, you know, invest and recruit new teachers at your school? That's a challenge that's happening nationally, which is driving enrollment in many private schools, uh, is looking for quality teachers. So, you know, attend events, talk with parents, discuss with teachers. And then one of the most important parts is each one of these schools, and I'm going to pass over to Drew here in a minute, uh, each one of these private schools require in most forms as a freshman year, some form of a placement test. And it's a piece of the puzzle and preparation for the test is important. It is incredibly important that your kids feel comfortable coming in. Well, that even starts with test prep. Uh, Drew, would you, would you mind taking this over for a few minutes and kind of going over Absolutely. some of the tests and I'll share some of those other pieces too with it? 
Yeah, cool. And I'll just feed off the the fact that it's great that this timeline is here because um, I will I will address this a little bit later about the timeline. And um, often parents might be coming coming uh, coming to me in September, uh, freaking out and saying I'm late, I'm late. But no, this is actually right on time. This is right on time to be thinking about all this stuff, um, even test prep. So let me uh, transition here for a sec to a different slide. One moment um, while I find this. There we go. Okay, so um, here we are. Oops, I accidentally opened Skype. That's not good. Um, sorry. Okay, can you see this? Yes. Great. That's not the first slide. Okay, cool. So test prep, test prep. Right. So the tests that if you're in the Tampa community, um, which I imagine many of our, our guests tonight are, you're going to be um, looking at two tests, the SSAT or the HSPT. If you're not in Tampa, which some of you might not be, you might be looking at the ISEE. Those are the three basic tests. Um, they all pretty much test the same kind of material. And I'm gonna take you through an overview of the material that they test. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about how to prepare, what to do for preparation, when to prepare, um, and a little bit of a timeline of when to take them and how to take them, and then some key reminders. So, um, so let's talk about the general overview between the SSAT and the HSPT. So the SSAT is for applicants to independent schools, private and independent schools. The HSPT is for applicants to Catholic schools. That's simple. They both test the same exact stuff, right? The reading, the verbal, and the math skills. Um, the main difference is in what's really focused on. So on the SSAT, it's about accuracy, only about accuracy, and students will have time to finish most of the sections. However, on the HSPT, there are more questions. It's an easier test. This is the test to get into Catholic school. And speed is really a priority. So you kind of want to be prepared that it's not just about if you're spending too much time on any one question, that's going to kind of burn you, right? And these are the kind of things that we focus on when we prepare. Um, another major difference between these two tests that students get really excited about when I teach the, uh, the in-school in class at Corbett Prep um, the, for the SSAT and HSPT, students will ask me many times, What's the guessing penalty? What's the guessing penalty? And it's and it's sometimes difficult for them to even understand what a guessing penalty really means. So in simple terms, for the SSAT, you lose points for missing questions. You lose a quarter of a point. Whereas on the HSPT, you don't lose any points. So the general rule of thumb is if you're taking the HSPT, you fill in every bubble. Whereas in the SSAT, you wanna have, have a little bit more of a careful approach. Um, Another point difference is the verbal skills. On the SSAT, you've got synonyms and analogies, um, everybody's favorite. And then on the <laughs> HSPT, you've got a few other things, antonyms, synonyms, analogies, classification, and logic. And that might sound complicated, but it's really not. For example, classification means there'll be questions that'll say, which of the following words is not like the other? Spoon, fork, knife, plate. That's a, that's, a, that's a pop quiz for, the, for you guys out there. Um, <laughs> and that's classification, basically. Um, math skills, pretty much the same. Geometry, algebra, arithmetic, number concepts. Um, and with the HSPT, adding a couple of things, numerical patterns and series. But remember, as I said, the HSPT is going to be more simple. More um, The questions are definitely easier. It's just that it moves along at a faster clip. Um, when to take these tests? Well, with the SSAT, you can take it as many times as you want. It's not advised to take it much more than twice if you need to, but you can. And you do not have to submit any of those scores to your high schools of choice until you are ready to do that. That is in your hands and in your control. Um, you can also take it at home. Um, there are multiple dates, or you can take it in person um, at, at one of these schools, um, one of these high schools that you're looking at. And it is offered relatively year round, although the testing season for, for your purposes are going to be pretty much from now until early, early, like until February-ish. 
Um, hey, Drew, Drew, can, yeah. I, can I share something that I learned today, actually? Please do, yeah. Uh, so one of my incredible teachers has a child applying to, and I think this is a great heads up for our parents online, uh, has a child applying to one of the local private schools. And okay. when you jump on the SSAT, you jump on, and you have to fill out which test you want to take. Um, and so you want to take it online. Do you want to take it on paper? Do you want to take it at home online? And yeah. you have to fill that out prior to selecting your location. So you might ask one of the local private schools, are you a testing site? They might say yes, and they usually do, but they might not be giving the type of test that you want. So they might be an on paper test, not an on the computer location test. So right, right. it was something, it was just popped up today I, when you're talking about this, it was something that I've never heard before, but I thought it was very unique. Uh, so you had a parent actually come to you and ask you about that? Like they were confused, right? Well, um, they actually, they had to pay for it twice. Uh, because yeah. they signed up for the wrong one. They really wanted their child to take it at this specific location. And right. after they signed up, that location did not offer that test. Right, right. And also, you know, the, the on-paper tests, there are limited numbers of slots because they're offered only on specific days, which I'll get to. And so um, definitely it's, it's great to come up with your timeline of when you're going to take that test so that you can get that slot at a school that's, you know, you want to you want to be able to take it at, at a school that's kind of close to where you live. So there's not some stressful experience in the morning driving across town. Um, so cool. Thanks for that anecdote. Um, the um, uh, So yeah, you can take the SSAT in different ways and at different times. However, the HSPT, you really can only take it one time um, at the actually at the, at the Catholic school. Um, not necessarily the Catholic school you'll be going to, but at a local Catholic school. Um, so they'll offer it at a Jesuit in Tampa or Academy of Holy Names, for example. And usually that's November, December, and you need to check with the school when you register for that. Finally, testing accommodations, which is, is a big thing. Obviously, you know, we've got students with IEPs and 501c3s. Is that the right word, Barbara? I know we 504. But I think 501c3 is, the, is a nonprofit organization. Uh, 504. Right. 504s. Thank you. Um, whether you have one of those, um, it, you have to um, you have to submit your your documentation through the SSAT.org, and they will give you they will grant that if you have the proper um, documentation. However, with the HSPT, um, you actually have to check directly with the school, as far as I understand, because basically the HSPT is is just a tool that that the Catholic schools use the way they want to use it. So they'll administer that test at the date they choose, and they'll they'll use it the way they want to use it, and so they'll they'll probably decide uh, their their recommendations or their um, their policies for um, uh, accommodations. Um, you can if you know more about that, Nick, you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's accurate. Um, cool. So that's just some general overview of those two tests. Um, let's talk about now um, how to prepare. I'm going to talk about um, the bare minimum, what I call the bare minimum of preparation. Um, you definitely don't want your eighth grader to show up at these tests and have never seen it before. That's a bad idea because stress is such a big part of this stuff that if we can relieve stress and just my goal as a tutor is to just really um, get that student in a, in a really good mind frame, with built, built up confidence and understanding of the test so that they can go in and perform at the tip top of their intelligence. You want them, it's like a performance and you want them to have a good one. Um, you can't always control that. There are many factors. I have students that, that have said to me, um, or parents that have said like, oh, after a test, they'd say, oh, um, Colin was, uh, was, had the flu and went in and took the test. And it's just like, oh God, that must have been miserable, but you can't control everything, right? And that's when you might want to take it again, if it's the SSAT. But um, taking a mock test is the bare minimum. Whether you find, get your hands on a copy, there's plenty of SSATs out there. Um, online, you on the SSAT.org website, you can um, you can buy purchase practice materials, and there's that opportunity to take that right there if your if your student is is self motivated. Um, and we happen to be offering a free mock test opportunity, uh, which I'll tell you more about on Saturday, October first. That students, if they want to take a full SSAT and get a score report, bare minimum, it's a great thing for you to do. Um, and um, yeah, if you have questions along the way, just yeah, pop them in the chat, we'll address them. So that's Saturday, October 1st. So back to this SSAT, the three types, the three types of tests. As we mentioned, there's paper tests, there's at home on your computer, and then there's this thing called Prometrics. Um, 
I, I have never, I haven't had many students take Prometrics and I'll tell you that I don't recommend it right off the bat, but there's one good thing about it is that there are multiple dates offered. So let me backtrack for a sec. Paper tests, um, that's the best, right? The best way is to do it on paper. It's the most ideal. You're not gonna have computer problems. Um, the student can underline and annotate and write on the page and it's what students are generally used to. The, the problem is that there are only a few dates that are offered and you definitely wanna go onto ssat.org, pop in your location that you're looking for, right? Where you're from and it'll give you the dates and it'll say like Tampa Prep is offering it on these dates. Berkeley's offering it on these dates. And you don't have to be going to those schools or applying to those schools. You can just choose those locations and take it there, right? And so I wrote down here a few of those dates and you can see it's like once a month. Um, at home, many more dates, lots more flexibility. Sometimes when families are traveling, they they say, you know, we now's the time to do it, but we, we're traveling so they can do it wherever they are. And at first, during the during the pandemic, when this was coming on board, there were a lot of problems, but they've gotten better at it. Um, there's a lot of you have to make sure that your computer's sort of up to spec, and there's a there's a process of of sort of onboarding your computer so that you can make sure you'll have a good experience beforehand. So that information is all on the website of SSAT. Um, and then the Prometric, what that is, is there are these centers that are located around the country that sort of feel like going to the DMV. Um, it's a very cold. <laughs> Uh, cubicle like experience, which I highly I don't recommend for an eighth grader for obvious reasons. I mean, they're already pretty stressed out as it is. Imagine them going into these places, but um, the the they are offered on multiple dates. Um, they're pretty flexible. And so it is an option. I have had parents who were in a bind and they got locked out of of and they couldn't find a test date and it just didn't work for them. And so they needed to get it done. So there's that. Um, cool. So that's testing timeline. Um, Finally, I will wrap my little spiel and then I'll send it back to Nick. Um, don't stress, you're right on time. This is the time to be thinking about test prep. Bare minimum preparation. So, okay, it's all about, in my, to my, in my opinion, it's all about your goals. Are you applying to a tip top boarding school like Deerfield or are you applying to a solid local a uh, private high school in your community. It's a big difference on what the expectations are for these tests. Both types of institutions are using these tests as information about how you are academically. Um, but if you are applying to like a tip top boarding school, you really need to dig deep and you need to max out your SSAT scores because the competition is intense. Um, but if you're not, then it's not the kind, it's not like the SAT or the ACT. You're not competing against the entire nation. For these college, for college, you're you're just in your local community, and these these schools are just looking at these tests to see who you are and where you are academically, and as Nick will probably talk about, it's not even just to get into the schools, it's it's also for how they place you, um, what they do with you, where where what kind of uh, you know gives them information about what to do with you. I'll let you talk more about that in a moment, Nick. Um, so what I recommend to, to parents is take a mock test, bare minimum, and if you do want to dig a little bit deeper. You can, you can opt to do some test preparation either on your own with the tutor. And I usually tell um, Tampa, parent, Tampa families, for example, five sessions. It doesn't need to be a full court press all year long. We need to do five solid sessions to get your student to be basically be working at the tip top of their intelligence at this moment. Um, um, and in terms of like what you can do to build your foundations for this test, it's September now. And your child will probably be taking the test, let's say in November. Um, many of my students will be taking it in November. You're, there's not a lot you can really do to move the needle in terms of the foundations. The foundations are how is your student as a reader? How are they as a math person? How are they in vocabulary? However, there are some things you can do. Um, I definitely always recommend reading, reading, reading. Um, make sure that they're doing well in math in school. If there's any issues in math, it needs to be addressed in school with their teachers, um, not with your tutor, because by that time it's a little too late, um, especially if there's some deep, deep remedial needs on math. Um, and then you can do some vocabulary building exercises, learn lists if your school's not already offering that, it can definitely be useful. Um, you never really know what words you might encounter on the test. Um, and finally, think of this, Think of this SSAT or HSPT as sort of the first experience your eighth grader is having. 
they're initiate being initiated into the American system of standardized testing, basically. Um, it, that's the kind of country we live in. Um, there's going to be a lot more of it uh, as they move along. So the skills they're going to be learning as they prepare and look at the HSPT or SSAT or ISEE are going to be the same exact skills on the SAT or ACT. The content will, of course, be made more advanced, but the types of strategies, the types of approaches, um, the types of focuses will be the exact same. So this is an investment in your, in just like the long-term haul. Um, and I've, I've left there uh, the, uh, the link if you want to sign up for that mock test. It's just at our website slash mock test. And I think that's all I have. Drew, so, could, yeah. Drew could you explain a little bit if I wanted to do a mock test, how, how this would work? Yes. Yeah, sure. Like you, oh, yeah. you said your computer needs, like, it, does your computer need to be like it does to take the real test and all that. No, actually, you... for the the mock test is is very simple. Um, you just basically you'll register. It's free, and um, you will be offered. You will be sent a PDF of an SSAT. You'll print it out in advance, and then you'll show up that day, and it'll be a Zoom link that will, that you'll receive, and there'll be a proctor there that will basically structure the time, advise the students how to move through the test, and uh, it'll create an atmosphere as if it feels real, which is pretty important. Because if you just give a student a test, there's real no guarantee that they're gonna um, that they're gonna feel that that pressure to really like give it the, their all, right? So I find that that that's um, that's a helpful kind of atmosphere to set. So yeah, it's pretty simple, pretty pretty simple. And then you get a score report right away, pretty much. There'll be a software that you receive that you can punch in your answers, um, and you'll get that score report right away. And then we'll offer you guys a free consultation. Um, but we can talk more about that if parents have questions. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so Nick, I guess the only thing that came up for me as I was talking that I, I would like you to address other than what you'd like, what you're gonna go forward with is um, how schools use these tests. Um, what are they for? I think parents often just think it's just to get in, in, in the Tampa community, for example. Yeah, so I think I think your reference to a Deerfield compared to a local, you know, good private school was wonderful actually. Uh, and it's very true. So when when you're doing the recruiting of eighth graders in the ninth grade, you are looking at multiple areas within that eighth graders background. Uh, traditionally, on your application, you're gonna have to fill out the parent information, family information, things they love, all those activities they've been part of, you know, all the way from, you know, if you were a Cub Scout or how that worked all the way growing up. Uh, you're going to be required to turn it in an English and a math reference, uh, usually from the school directly. At some points, they'll ask you to send that to the current teacher and or they will have it printed out. You'll have to sign the bottom of it and bring it to that teacher. Those are confidential recommendations that would be sent out. Uh, additionally, at like our school, we went, we go ahead and for every one of our eighth graders, we do a reference as well, like a full out reference of who these children are. It's really neat to see the eighth grade and seventh grade and sixth grade teachers get to raise their hand and write a reference about the kids. Uh, and many schools will do that, or you can find a person within their life. You know, adding that on is never a bad thing. Uh, having a wonderful personal reference about a child. Uh, and then from there, you'll have the SSAT or you'll have the HSPT that comes in from those sites specifically. And, and so really, as the admissions director at times, you're looking at outliers, really highs, really lows. Is there something that's going to jump out on those tests that I'm also, maybe I'm not seeing in grades, or maybe that now looks like a trend that I'm looking at for those children specifically? So it is a large part of the puzzle because you're going to be looking at uh, you know, what is the overall goal of this child and you know, do they fit our environment and do they match up with the other kids that we've accepted for the last two or three years? So my teachers know what type of kids we had coming in the door. Uh, but it's also a piece of the puzzle and it's not the whole piece. And I think that's really important to remember because our kids are so dynamic as eighth graders and they have so much room to grow. So you know, part of this as well, one of the things that I think Drew hit on really nicely is, is, you know, allow your children to have the best opportunity to do well in this test by putting in enough time without the stress of overthinking it. Um, and, you know, get them a good night's sleep beforehand. Do these preparation techniques that allow you to come in there. I, I Drew, I, and we do that with all of our standardized testing here, you know, when we take a test and, you know, and, and teach them some of those skill sets and give them somebody away from a parent who is, you know, right. grabbing a magazine out of, uh, out of uh, Barnes and Noble um, and telling your child to please study. Uh, we know how hard it is to coach our own kids. And so allowing somebody to have that piece that's done this for many, many years 
uh, is, a, is a big piece of this. And I, I'll tell you, you know, the story I was going to share about Drew was uh, a few years back, I was at a school that the high school was, you know, started enrolling a little bit, but we were still learning college counseling. And uh, I kept seeing a, a noticeable difference in a few of our kids' scores. And I finally went and asked one of my parents and Drew, that's how we initially, that's the first time I ever heard your name was you were doing Saturday test prep for SATs for some of my high school baseball players. And, ah. uh, and it was truly remarkable um, uh, of what you were able to do with those kids. Not, not just to, you know, you know, moving the line a little bit, but also getting them to be comfortable and confident when they were walking into a room. And uh, yeah, was that SAT you said? Yes, that was for yeah. the high school. That was the high for college baseball placement. players. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was for college yeah. placement. And then, uh, you know, for years, I knew that the Previous head of school here, Dr. Schwarzman, who's uh, just a brilliant mind, um, she used Drew to help our eighth graders always kind of move forward too. So we've, we've kept that going here. Yeah. But, you know, looking at that, one of the things that I would love to partner with you on though, and you hit it a couple of times for the parents online, is the SSAT is more difficult because of the span of what they cover academically. Right. And... And so when you say you take both, say you're applying at a local Catholic school in Tampa and you're applying at an independent school, your children might be scoring in the 80th percentile, 90th percentile, different things like that on the HSPT. But on the SSAT, they might be in the 45th to 55th percentile, 60th percentile. Drew, am I, am I right by saying absolutely, that? Absolutely, absolutely. Right, and people will freak out about that. Yes, and so as a parent, um, and I wish I could see some parent faces online, but I can tell you as a parent, when you get that score and, the, you know, every score you've seen has been specifically for, you know, eighth graders against eighth graders, seventh graders against seventh graders, the SSAT is a, is a test that you might, your child might need to take as a freshman at some point. Mm -hmm. And so that span of their knowledge point is going to be much different than what those scores are. So as a parent, when you see that score at home and it's different than what you traditionally see, but it's still in that range, uh, keep your calmness as well. Allow your stress to back off a little bit. Ask somebody who knows more about this than you. Reach out to, to Drew. You know, ask, you know, what does this look like in this area? Reach out to the admissions directors at the schools that you're applying to and just, you know, be, be very comfortable. You know, is this traditionally where you see most eighth graders without it, you know, identifying your specific one? That's uh, great. Yeah, it's, it's something we noticed last year. I was, we had a, a wonderful group of kids get into one of our um, uh, independent, Catholic schools in our area, uh, which is very, very difficult to get into. And we had, we were very fortunate. And I asked them specifically, where were my kids scoring? And, you know, they said on the, S on the HSBT, everything was in the 80th and 90th percentile. Like we did really, really well. Those same kids at a local independent school were sitting more in that 55 to 60th range on the SSAT. So it is something to be aware of as a parent that these scores might look different than even what your kids have taken at the, you know, middle school level and things like that. So, uh, yep. Yep. That's actually, that's, that's great because people, it's very disconcerting to get that low percentage score. And it's, it's not only just that you're competing against, um, that, that the span of the test is, 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 is more deep because you're getting material that like an 11th grader might have learned because there are 11th graders taking the SSAT to transfer to a different high school, as you mentioned, but you're also the kids who are, are, um, who you're being compared to are just students who are applying to private school around the nation. That's a different subset than all the students um, around the country. Um, so the percentages are gonna be much different. Um, and, and I think it's great, Nick, that you said to just call the school and, and just ask, um, because I think parents can get pretty scared, I think about, um, you know, about say, saying the wrong thing or not getting in. And I guess you can call, you're saying what you can call anonymously and just really say without giving the student's name away. I think you can even ask, you know, earlier, I mean, the admissions directors around the Tampa area are wonderful people. Uh, they are, uh, many of them are dear friends. Uh, they are, they love the kids that come and apply to their schools. And I think many times, you know, they will be pretty open in a conversation to share. Yeah, you know, normally in the SSATs, we see kids from 55 percentile to 80 percentile, you know, in that range you know, based on that. And then we look at everything else. They're going to be really, really upfront with you. I mean, and it might be higher than that based on the admissions year, but they're looking at their pool of applicants too, right? So even yeah. though we're in this big window, when you're applying to that school, they're looking at the pool of their applicants and where they are. And, you know, much like, like Drew will be able to share from the Northeast, you know, Northeast students are practicing this test significantly earlier than most of our Southeast uh, families. Right. 
And right. so, you know, there's different things like that as well. So it's yeah. just something to be aware of as a parent, as you're looking at these independent schools and you're looking at these different tests. Uh, the other part for the HSPT is very rarely, but you will, you will at times find somebody who requires a written section of the HSPT <laughs> as well. Mm. And if you are applying to a school with that need, you really need to focus on taking the test at that location because most places with the HSPT don't ask for that. So you just need, that's something to be aware of. Ask them specifically, do you recommend me taking it at your location? You know, is there an additional part that I need to take at that location? And so that way there, if that happens, you can have that information, make sure they're going to share those results. Um, I would love to say that all independent schools work really, really well together and share everything, but it's not always the case. Um, oh, so you're saying if a student took it at Catholic school A, they may not, that test score may not be trans, uh, may not be translated to test private school B? Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sometimes. I mean, yeah, but in Tampa, you've got, you've really only got what, one girls school, one boys school, and then one co-ed Catholic school, or are there more than that? Actually, There's more than that now. You know, it's it's slowly expanding a little bit. I mean, it, it, so part of one of the things I want to share is there's, you know, there's lots of private schools. You know, uh, you have faith-based religious schools. So several Christian schools within our area. You think of the, in the Tampa area, I'll just name a few. You know, you have the Cambridge Christian. Um, you have Calvary Christian now, which is pretty close within our region. Uh, Catholic diocesan schools, you have Tampa Catholic, you have Bishop McLaughlin, which many of the North, North families also look at, um, you know, independent Catholic schools, Jesuit High School and Academy, uh, mm -hmm. neither one of, they, they partner with the diocese, but they're not diocesan schools, Oh, I see. Um, so they can require a different test for many years, and I, I'd have to look and reach out to Mr. Matesic at Jesuit, but for many years, Jesuit required the HSPT and a writing piece of it, so if you wanted to apply to Jesuit, you had to you had to take that writing piece there. Yeah. Uh, whereas Tampa Catholic didn't require the writing piece, so they couldn't share. TCs wouldn't share with Jesuit. <laughs> right, so, right, right. Yeah. You know, so you have some of those little dynamics, and then you know, uh, and then you have your independent schools. You know, starting from the north, kind of working down. Uh, you have Academy at the Lakes. You have Carrollwood Day School. You have Tampa Prep. You have Berkeley Prep uh, that offer high school academics gotcha. and. Uh, you know, and that's, uh, those are areas too within that mix for those high school pieces, you know, when they're kind of looking at that. So. Great. Um, I'm going to, um, I'm going to open up the floor now um, since we're com coming close to eight o'clock. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute or put it in the chat. Um, we, uh, uh, we'd love to hear from you guys um, who've been here with us. 